Good morning, brothers and sisters. I wish you each one happy Sabbath. As we return to this portion of the book of Zechariah in chapter 6, as we return to the discussions that we were having this last week, shall we thank our Heavenly Father for his providence, for his blessings, and for the guidance that he has provided us all. Shall we seek him now in prayer as we open this word so that we may more clearly understand that which he would have us to know? Shall we pray? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these hours of the Sabbath. We thank you for the week that is, is behind us and for all of the events of this week. Direct us now, Father. Guide us in all things. As we open your word, as we consider these words that were provided to the children of Israel at the time about when the second temple was to be dedicated, we ask, Father, that you help us to understand how we are to be dedicated to you so we might become the living stones of the temple that will be built without hands. Direct us now. Please guide us. I pray for a blessing on each person that is here. And for those that will view this later using the internet, help us to understand. And for this, we need your spirit. We need your angels to protect us and to guide us. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to do. For this, Father, we ask. In this, Father, we pray. For we need you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, last week, we were having a conversation about these passages. As Sister White wrote in letter 128 in 1909, now is our time to make decided efforts to awaken the people who have never, never yet been warned. She's quite clear about this. She's also stated that I am concerned because so many things engage the minds of our physicians, which keep them from the work that God would have them to do as evangelists. Are we all not physicians and are we all not evangelists? From the light God has given me, I know that the living preacher who is consecrated and devoted and knows how to put his trust in God is greatly needed. How rare do we find this person? How rare do we see this occurring? We need 100 workers where now we have one. At this moment, there are eight of us that in one way or another are looking upon this part of the printed word. Now, if we are so few, and yet there are so many that are needed, we need to be prepared to help increase the numbers that are going to give this message. There is a great work to be done before satanic opposition shall close up the way and our present opportunities will be lost. Time is rapidly passing. Our publications are numerous, but the Lord calls for the men and the women in our churches who have the light to engage in genuine missionary work. Let them in all humility exercise their God-given talents in proclaiming the message that should come to the world at this time. Here again, a message that shall come, that should come to the world at this time. Now we come down to the next verse. Okay, so just to comment on this a little bit. Please. Now, of course, here she's talking about we have all these publications. And, and, and I would say that a lot of people are dependent upon, like, the idea is that, well, we have, you know, nowadays radio stations, uh, different sort of television channel channels, of course, the Internet, and that all of this is supposed to somehow accomplish the work, right? But the reality is the personal labor that we do is – is much deeper than, and, and there's so many voices for people to hear as well. Like we live in what is called the information age where there's so much information. If you think about, uh, you know, you make a video and you get, uh, you know, 75 views on a video, you know, that's, that's a fair number of people in some ways, right? But compared to the world, it's, it's nothing, right? So there's this whole world to be reached and so many voices speaking to them. And yet when we start laboring with just a few people, maybe one person, 
that becomes much more effective. And in the long run, and this kind of relates to what we were talking about last night as well, but, you know, we have a, a personal work to do in our own lives, and we should be seeking to reach out to those around us. But the work is much bigger than any human being can accomplish. There, you know, it's, it, it's the Lord's work. And he, he will take the work into his own hands, which is the thing that I'm looking forward to as time goes on to see how God is, what symbol means God is going to use uh, to spread the gospel to the world. Okay. Now, in Zechariah 6.14, And the crowns shall be to Helem, and to Tobijah, and to Jedediah, and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Now, just four verses previously, in 6.10, we are told, take them of the captivity, even of Heldiah, of Tobijah, of Jedediah, which are come from Babylon. And come thou the same day and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. Now, help me understand here. First, Zechariah is being told to take these men of captivity, Heldiah, Tobijah, Jedediah, and to go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. But in this verse, we have no Heldai, but we have Helem. But Tobijah and Jedediah remain. And to Han, the son of Zephaniah, not Josiah, the son of Jephaniah. Why? Are we now looking at the first and the last being changed? What is there about the names of these men that is important for us to address? Hmm. Now, when I went and I looked, held dying, it depends entirely on, on whose dictionary. dictionary you're going to use, how you're going to approach this right on down the line. Because Heldai can mean, from the Hebrew, smooth, slippery, fleeting, transitory existence. Yet, Tobijah, we have Yehovah is good. And Jedediah, we have the hand of the Lord or confessing the Lord. Now, Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, compared with Hen, the son of Zephaniah. What do we have here? Why, why are these being addressed? Any thoughts? Well, I have no idea. Now, I have held I as worldliness. Okay. Uh, you know, Tobijah, I mean, that, that's just plain straight Hebrew. Uh, Tov means good, and uh, Yah is reference to Jehovah. So Jehovah is good. Okay. For the goodness of Jehovah. Um, well, is, is it correct to say that the most common Hebrew word for grace is hen? Yeah, well, hen is grace. Um, that's, that's just normally. And what normally. is grace? Well, favor. Unmerited way, favor. It, yeah. Yeah, well, though the word itself doesn't necessarily have unmerited, but we say that God's grace is unmerited. But the word itself doesn't actually have unmerited. It's just favor any grace or favor pleasantness beauty now depending on again whose dictionary you use here is helem helem can mean either healing or it can mean shepherd well i have as as a dream as you you have it as a dream yeah strength and a dream uh, both uh brown drivers briggs and strong say it refers to a dream okay Right. And but, you know, it's it's never used as a word. It's always used as the name. But uh, the word that it comes from, Kalam, is uh, 2492. Let me just hang on. What's it doing here? It is the, it's that that word used quite a bit um, ref, to refer to a dream. So since it's, you know, like when. Joseph dreamed a dream. Jacob dreamed. 
right? All of these are kalam. So, did, did Daniel dream? Yeah, well, in the dream that is, yeah, Daniel uh, chapter 2, you have Nebuchadnezzar dreaming. Um, but part of the problem with Daniel is it's in, you have that part written in Aramaic, so it's right. going to be a different word. So I assume it'd be just an Aramaic version of the same word, right? Because Daniel, Daniel 1 to 2, uh, it's still in Hebrew, right? Until, until you get uh, Nebuchadnezzar speaking, then it's going to change to Aramaic. So you get Hebrew. Okay. I'm, at, I'm asking more like, you know, Daniel 7, 1. Yeah. So in Daniel 7, 1, which is going to be Aramaic, um, let me just see what that word is. Yeah, that's 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 just the same word, but Aramaic. So it's just one number different, 2493 instead of 2492. Yep, so he had dreams. It actually looks pretty much like the same word. Right. Just Aramaic instead of Hebrew. So if the crowns are given, if the crown shall be to Helem, to those that have the vision and to Tobijah, those that recognize that Yehovah is good, and to Jedediah, to those uh, that are confessing the Lord. Yeah, Jehovah is known, right? It's the word. Okay. Um, and to Grace, son of Zephaniah. Now, what does Zephaniah mean? Well, Yah has, has hidden secreted or treasured so in this one verse in comparison with a verse four verses previous we have quite a lot to address from those that will receive the crown is this a representation of the 144,000 or is this a representation of the redeemed of all of the earth? I have no idea. I, I don't really understand this whole section, what it's about. Well, I'd say judging by what we've seen so far, it, it is. It's for all Christians, all fervent, active Christians. Yeah, it's just when he's taking these people of the captivity and they're going to go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. And then they're gonna, and then it says, then take silver, gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. You know, and then he's gonna say, speak unto him, saying, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, behold, the man whose name is the branch, and he shall go up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. And the crowns shall be to Helam and to Bijah and to Jedediah and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. Now, so you've got these children of the captivity. Are they the ones making these crowns? Like, why are they going into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah? And then there's this declaration regarding the branch and about building the temple. And then that these crowns are going to be given to these particularly named Israelites. It, it's, to me, it's not clear exactly what's happening in this, this story. Right? You understand what I'm saying? I get it. Because like, there are obviously different people, but some are being brought into this house, and then they're also going to have gold and silver. So are they the ones who are going to make these crowns? Is there a group of people making the crowns and a group of people receiving crowns? All right. So those that are making the crowns, when they set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, is Joshua representing Christ? Well, yes, we understand that from earlier in Zechariah, that, that he, he, represents, he represents Christ representing us. Okay. If that makes sense. Right, because the high priest, you know, Christ is our high priest. He took upon himself humanity. And so so we can see that there's this, you know, take off his uh, garments. He's going to have filthy garments and you're going to put this change of raiment. 
And, and so the work of the high priest is the work that Christ is doing, is the work in us through taking humanity, dying for our sins and all the different things, uh, symbolism in the temple. So, so Joshua does represent Christ in that, in that context, right, as our mediator. But in, in this case, I mean, Joshua is Joshua, the son of Hosedek, right? Like he's a historic person. He's just becoming s- symbolic here, even though he literally exists. So what does Joshedek mean? Yeah, so um, that means, well, you can see the word uh, jo- Jehovah in there. Right. And also Tzedek, uh, right? 6663, which is commonly translated as righteousness. We've seen that word a lot. Right, so that's the the words that are in there. So to justify or to make right, right. So Jehovah justifies or makes right. So Eldine, Tobijah, Jedediah, go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. They take the silver and the gold and make the crowns that are set upon the head of Joshua, Yeshua, the son of the father, the son of righteousness. For Yeshua is our high priest. Would that be correct? Yeah. So, th- I mean, this has something to do with the change of character. Because I-, I-, I have a feeling that the names here, like the people, are the same people, but some are given different names in verse 14. So, Josiah and Hen would be the same person? Helen, uh, Helem and Helda would be the same person. Tobijah is Tobijah. Jedediah is Jedediah. Yeah, Jedediah is Jedediah. And then the one Hen, that's going to be the son of Zephaniah. So that would be Josiah, the son of Zephaniah, is going to have the name Hen. Hen, right? Grace. You know. What does the last sentence in that verse say? So uh, for a moral in the in the temple of the Lord. Memorial? That a is, memorial they're just gonna, for a yeah, temple they're just in the Lord. Lord. The crowns are just going to be placed in the temple as a memorial, a reminder. Now, well, I, was this, thinking, yeah. I was thinking it as a, as a trophy. God's going to take those 144,000 as a trophy, right? But yeah. Well, yeah. Sort of. That's what a kind of a memorial is. But these these are the crowns themselves. So I'm, I'm trying to, to get this. Uh, so it could be that the gold and silver is actually collected from Heldai, Tobijah, and Jedediah, that they actually have collected the silver and gold. Because I get the impression maybe that um, Zechariah is supposed to make the crowns and that... Uh, Heldai, Tobijah, Jedediah, and Josiah, or Hen. So, so we got, let me see here. Yeah. I'm just not quite sure exactly what's happening. You know, it's a little bit obscure. Yeah, I'm not really sure what it means, but, but it definitely has some symbolism relating to, uh, the final generation, I would think. There's no specific way in which I can understand this. Okay. Let's continue and see if there's something further we can find. And they that are far off shall come and build the temple of the Lord. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass if ye will diligently obey the voice of of the Lord your God. Now, other verses that are used in conjunction with this by the translators. Isaiah 57, 19. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him, along with Isaiah 60, verse 10. And the sons of the strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, But in my favor have I had mercy upon thee. And then we have Ephesians 2, 13 and 19. But now in Christ Jesus, ye 
who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Ye shall know that the Lord has sent me unto you. If we look back to Zechariah 2.9 and 4.9, Behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. <clears throat> now, here Mrs. White repeats Zechariah 6, verses 9 to 15. Mm -hmm. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Take of them of the captivity, even of Heldai, of Tobijah, and Jedidiah, which are come from Babylon. And come thou the same day, and go into the house of Josiah, the son of Zephaniah. And then take silver and gold, and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest. And speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit, upon, sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Manuscript 65a, 1900, paragraph 18. And the crown shall be to Helem and Tobijah, and to Jedidiah, and to Hen, the son of Zephaniah, for a memorial in the temple of the Lord. And they that are far off shall come and build in the temple of the Lord. And ye shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. And this shall come to pass, if you will diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God. What does it mean to diligently obey his voice? I will present it this way. Are we not commanded to keep all of the commandments and statutes that have been given by God and that were given to the children of Israel and to us today? What would you say? Yeah, I'd say except, except for the ceremonial ones, yes. In the name of the Lord, we ask his people who have means to arise and realize that God, who is the owner of all property which his believing ones possess, shall prove themselves faithful stewards of God. Repair the condition of God's working machinery, that the hearts of God's people shall not be made sad. Not in their own power did the apostles accomplish their mission, but in the power of the living God. Their work was not easy. The opening labors of the Christian church were attended by hardship and bitter grief. In their work, the disciples constantly encountered privation, calumny, and persecution. But they counted not their lives dear unto themselves and rejoiced that they were called to suffer for Christ. Irresolution, indecision, weakness of purpose found no place in their efforts. They were willing to spend and be spent. The consciousness of the responsibility resting on them purified and enriched their experience, and the grace of heaven was revealed in the conquests they achieved for Christ. With the mighty omnipotence, God worked through them to make the gospel triumphant. Is the work of God in this earth going to be any different than the beginning of this work? Will the ending work on this earth be any different from the opening labors of the Christian church? Well, there's definitely a parallel. For God's the first and the last. Right. Upon the foundation that Christ himself had laid, the apostles built the church of God. In the scriptures, the figure of the erection of a temple is frequently used to illustrate the building of the church. Zechariah refers to Christ as the branch that should build the temple of the Lord. He speaks of the Gentiles as helping in the work. They that are far off shall come and build the temple of the Lord. Isaiah declares, the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls. Zechariah 6, 12, 
6.15 and Isaiah 60, verse 10. Writing of the building of this temple, Peter says, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. First Peter 2, 4 and 5. In the quarry of the Jewish and Gentile world, the apostles labored, bringing out stones to lay upon the foundation. In his letter to the believers at Ephesus, Paul said, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 19-22. Behold the man whose name is the branch. He shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne. Zechariah 6, 12 and 13. A fountain was to be opened for sin and uncleanness. Zechariah 13, 1. The sons of men were to hear the blessed invitation. Ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye, buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me. Hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Isaiah 55, 1 to 3. Now, those verses conclude what we've looked at here. Do we have any other thoughts or comments about this particular chapter in Zechariah? Well, since a branch shall build the, the Lord's temple, but it also says strangers shall build it. So the strangers coming in are those who, who receive Christ and want to work with him. It's like the inflow of people, I guess, replacing the ones that have left and more than compensating for their defection. So on what one of the things the Lord's really showing me lately is uh, the friends of mine, for instance, that I have around here are a lot more winsome, shall I say, than many Seventh-day Adventists I've met and okay. or I've known. And I just welcome them. I mean, I can see the Lord working through them, too. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay. So what we will do now, we proceed now to Zechariah chapter 7. Verse 1, the Jews having sent to inquire concerning the set fasts. Verse 4, Zechariah reproveth the hypocrisy of their fasts. Verse 8, they are exhorted by repentance to remove the cause of their calamity. And it came to pass in the fourth year of King Darius that the word of the Lord came unto Zechariah in the fourth day of the ninth month, even in Kislev or Kislev. So is this the fourth day of the ninth month, roughly of 518? Yes. Yeah, so where is this here? Oh, I just had it. Yeah. So this is going to be, I believe, 518. It's the fourth day of the ninth month. So it's going to end up being yeah, so the fourth day of, of Kislev in the fourth year of Darius is going to be December 7th, 518 BC. Okay. On the Julian calendar, right? So, <clears throat> so, we so this, is, this is two years before Darius's decree. Right, because Darius's decree is going to happen in 516, and then the temple is going to be dedicated in 515. Okay. And 
And if we remember that uh, in chapter one, it's going to be in the second year of Darius that Zechariah starts prophesying. So this is roughly two years later. Okay, so we're December 7th on the Julian calendar. Yeah. Okay. When they had sent unto the house of God, Sherezer and Regemelech, and their men to pray before the Lord or to, to entreat the face of the Lord. Now, in the 1769 Bible, the translators would refer back to 1 Samuel 13, 12. Therefore, said I, the Philistines will come down now upon me to Gilgal. And I have not made supplication unto the Lord. I forced myself, therefore, and offered a burnt offering. Who is speaking here? That's Saul. And how is Saul forcing himself? Well, it, he, he's, he's not really. Right. Now, I'm not sure why they give us a reference to that story. Well, we also will have this. Which, well, what's that? Well, we will have this, which will come up after we have finished chapter 7, because Zechariah 8.21 and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Now, Sherezer, to protect or preserve the king or prince of fire. Regemelech, friend of the king or the chief eunuch of the king. What friend? No. Where, where are you getting these definitions? I'm not, never a fan. I mean... Uh, regem means a heap, like usually a stone heap, a pile of stones, and of course Malik is king. But how do they get friend of the king? That's or protect and serve the king. What what dictionary gives you these? And most of them, what when I pull these up, I've usually used a Byram publication, but I'll look at it real quick and see which one they were. Yeah, because yeah. Well, often these de definitions you give, wherever you're getting them from, they're not very good. Okay. Because it's not a friend of the king or chief eunuch of the king. I mean, you can just see it plainly in Hebrew. There's nothing there that would relate to friend or eunuch or chief eunuch or anything like that. The def definition I have from the uh, exhaustive dictionary of Bible names is also saying it's uh, a friend of the friend of the king it also says stoning of the king stoning of the king yes yeah anyway I, I don't think that's what it means now one of those that i'm looking at right now is taking this name from from the babylonian i know i cannot okay so there's two different words regem right which friend and then there's uh this other word Ragam, to stone or slay or kill by stoning. And then you got, so, I mean, they, they are words that look very similar. And then you have Regeb, and that's the one that I think it should be, um, is 57263, which means to pile together um, to make a pile of stones. Um, so So I guess it's just choosing... The, which word you choose that that name is made out of, right? So, I mean, it is possible if it if it was this other word, but uh, it it uh, to me it just looks like a heap, the king's heap, right? Uh, and Strong says the same thing. So, so Strong translates it as the king's heap. Regem Melek, which would make sense. And that's how it's so spelled. You said, he, you said heap or heat? Heap, like a pot. Heap, heap, heap. Okay. okay. And to speak unto the priests, which were in the house of the Lord of hosts, and to the prophets, saying, Should I weep in the fifth month, separating myself, as I have done these so many years? So what are they referring to about weeping in the fifth month? So that's when the temple was destroyed. And in the seventh month, that's when Gedaliah was killed. Now, there's actually going to be four different fasts. There's a fast of 
I think the fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month, and the tenth month, right? That's going to be mentioned uh, where? Um, just hang on. Yeah, Zechariah 8, verse 19 is going to talk about this. Uh, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, the fast of the fifth month, the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah. Joy and gladness and cheerful feasts, therefore, love the truth and peace. So what are those months, the fourth, the fifth, the seventh, and, and the tenth? What are, what are they fasting about? We should be able to answer that. Well, the seventh month, of course, we have uh, the Feast of, of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Yeah, but the fast that they're doing there is, is for regarding the death of Gedaliah. Okay. Right. So Gedaliah is going to be killed in the seventh month. So these all have to do with the events connected with the siege and destruction of Jerusalem. Okay. So they're going to fast on the 10th day of the 10th month to commemorate the start of the siege, right? They're going to fast on the ninth day of the fourth month when the siege ended. They're going to fast on, uh, I think, the ninth day of the fifth month, if uh, the ninth of Av, instead of the 10th of Av, uh, to commemorate the destruction of the temple. And I'm not sure which day in the seventh month that this fast for Gedaliah is, but that that's what these fasts are. So they're commemorating the events connected with the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, so in chapter 8, where you have, um, uh, let me see here, what was the verse? It was chapter 8, verse 19. That was... Um, so he's going to talk about all these different fasts, but in chapter 7, verse uh, verse 3 to 5, when he's talking about it, in, in verse 5, he's going to say, um, speak unto the people of the land and to the priests, saying, when ye fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh month, even these 70 years, or in Hebrew, it could be even uh like these 70, they have it as those in the King James, but it's, it's exactly the same phrase as in chapter 1, verse 12, talking about these 70 years. Did you at all fast unto me, even to me? So, so they're not going to put the fast of the second month here and the fast of the 10th month. Why? Why are they just going to mention the fast of the 5th and 7th month? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the fourth month and the tenth month relates to the, the siege. So it's yeah. just, picking, just picking up uh, the destruction of the temple and then of the governor. Just one thing about the governor. He's mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 25, verse 25. Uh, it mentions just the seventh month. It doesn't mention the actual day. But yeah, I, mention, I didn't think it did mention the actual day. Yeah, but it does mention that ten men came and smote him, which to me, that kind of my mind just goes to the tenth day when you see ten men. I know we don't know but it's sort of maybe connects the tenth day and the seventh month in that way. Maybe. That that could be. That they because remember they, they don't have the day of atonement. That is they can't observe the day of atonement um in the sanctuary because it doesn't exist. Yes. Okay. All right. So there is no temple. And and even when they do finally build the temple um, in Nehemiah, they're going to mourn over the fact that they can't observe the Day of Atonement because there is no ark in the sanctuary. So even though they have a temple, they they can't really observe all of the uh, the ceremonies that require the work in the in the most holy place dealing with the ark. So so he's going to refer to a period of seventy years. So there is 70 years from when the temple is destroyed to when it is uh, rebuilt. Well, it's 70 years and seven months, technically. But he's going to talk about this period of 70 years. Now, if he talked about the fast in the uh, the 10th month, well, that, that would actually have been the start of the siege, and that was like a year and a half earlier. So, so one of the things you can see is that there is a period of 70 years that are being referred to. But it hasn't been 70 years yet, right? Because okay. the temple is destroyed in 586, and this is in 518. They still got 
uh, two more years until 70 years are up. And, and the same in chapter one. I mean, we went through this before, but in chapter one, verse 12, where it's going to talk about uh, the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah against which thou hast had indignation these three score and 10 years or 70 years? Well, it's obviously not 70 years yet. And it says these three score and 10 years. It's, it's exactly the same in the Hebrew, the same expression where it says those 70 years or these 70 years, same thing. There's no difference in Hebrew. So my, my argument is that the angel here who's talking to Zechariah recognizes that it's a period of 70 years in which the temple lay, lies in ruins, right? That, it's, it's, that that 70 years isn't yet completed. But the angel recognizes it as 70 years prior to its completion. It's definitely not the 70 years uh, of the captivity in Babylon, right? It's not the 70 years of the Babylonian captivity, um, especially when you look at chapter 7, verse 5, because you can see the fifth and seventh month. If they had counted from, you know, for the Babylonian captivity, there's nothing that marks the fifth and seventh month in the Babylonian captivity. It's only from the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Right in the fifth month, and then the seventh month, the death of Gedaliah. But it, it, people understand what I'm saying. It, is that clear to everyone? That this period of seventy years is not the Babylonian captivity period, and it is the period for the temple. And at the time that Zechariah is given this prophecy, it's still not yet seventy years. Seventy years have not yet ended. I've seen that on a line. Saw that on a line. Yeah, yeah. So. So this was one of the keys. So when I was, you know, first going back over Leviticus 26 back in 2013 and understood the four seven times, then I recognized that there was these different periods of 70 years. And, and many people just read these verses in Zechariah and just say, oh, 70 years, that must be the 70 years of the captivity, right? They don't really think beyond that. It's 70 years. It's just the same period. But then I saw there was different periods of 70 years and that and that these periods are going to end with decrees. Right. So Darius's decree ends the, the fourth seven times. Cyrus's decree ends uh, two periods, actually. That is the two periods of 70 years that are added together or prolonged. Uh, the 70 years from Manasseh to Daniel's captivity and from Daniel's captivity to Cyrus becoming King, and then, of course, like the end of the Babylonian captivity with the decree. So, and then we have uh, Artaxerxes' decree ends a period of 140 years. That is from uh, Jehoiachin's captivity in uh, 597 to Artaxerxes' decree in 457 is a period of 140 years. So these are just, these are important little details that, uh, you know, I know I've presented them other times. but So here he's going to mention the fast of the fifth and seventh month. Later, he's going to mention all four fasts connected with the destruction of Jerusalem. But these ones are the ones connected to the 70 years. Where the fast of the 10th month and the fast, well, you could say the fast of the fourth month would be, they could have put that in there as well, I guess. But the fast of the 10th month then definitely would not fit in the period of 70 years. Okay, right. Okay. It's interesting because when you take four, five, seven, and you multiply it by ten, you have the year in which the third decree goes forward, multiplied by ten, the number of judgments. But if you combine all of these together, you also wind up with the net effect of 70 multiplied by 20. So you're just saying like four, five, seven, that's like 457. Correct. Okay, so you're saying 457 BC, that's the fourth month, the fifth month, the seventh month. Mm -hmm. And then what are you doing with the two or the 10, pardon me, you're just multiplying that by 10 or what are you doing? Correct. Okay, and then what does that do? The resultant product is 1,400 which is the same 
as 70 multiplied by 20. Now, okay. So 4 times 5 times 7. Times 10. Times 10. So 1,400. And you're saying that's, yeah, 70 times 20. Okay. Yeah. But I just think it's interesting. I never noticed the 457 with the 457. But it strikes me because last Sabbath, I attended a presentation, and as I was walking out from the sanctuary of this church, I noticed that the seating capacity by the um, fire marshal in that area was a total of 457. Oh, yeah. So we are now past the point of our time today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we just have my study next. So All right. So, does anyone else have any question or comment? Okay, shall we then close this with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, there is much yet that we need to understand. Help us now, Father, through this day to listen, to learn, to be guided by you. May your will be done. I pray for the following study. I pray for Theodore as he presents to us. We ask, Father, for your watch care and your guidance in all things. For this, Father, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.